Well, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this very uh, hot topic and, uh, and taking a position that I think is unpopular with doctors and patients, that biosimilars should be used as indicated in place of our current biologic therapies. And, well, I'm, the previous speaker didn't really talk about the key issue. It's dollars. So this graph shows the healthcare expenditures in the U.S over time and you can see that this is, if this is your personal budget, you'd recognize this is not sustainable. And if we look at drug therapies, the pie graph, you'll see that monoclonal antibodies in general, the green, constitute a great amount of expenditures. But look at the blue uh, slice of the pie. TNF blockers themselves represent 21 percent of drug expenditures. This is a tremendous amount of money. And to quote one of your former presidents, it's the economy, stupid. We have unlimited ability to consume resources for health care. This is not sustainable. And if we want to deliver the greatest good to the most people, we have to control this. So it's a classic tension between individual and societal benefit. We've heard um, a nice discourse by David on why biosimilars are different. And the fact, the key issue is because they're made in living organisms, you can't produce identical molecules. And really to take a finer look at that, it's really the quaternary structure, and this is the glycosylation pattern that really makes a difference. And the problem is, is that cell lines are very bad minions. They don't do what they're told to do. In fact, if you change the culture conditions, if you change the carbohydrate conditions in the media, the temperature, the pH, then you will get differences in the glycosylation calyx of the molecule, which is potentially an immunogenic trigger. So this is just showing how it works, and you can see that there are enzymes that tack on these sugar residues, and they, act, they actually do this in an almost a random fashion. So one key point is that all of our innovator drugs are actually mixtures with complex carbohydrate patterns. So they're not identical uh, copies of themselves. And that, I think, is a key issue. And what the T cell is shown here, this is a consummation of marriage between an antigen presenting cell and T cell at the top, is it recognizes the three dimensional structure of the antigen in the presenting cell. So it's really about that structure. So you could argue, and I think David alluded to it, that if there are differences, you could have differences of immunogenicity. But what I draw your, and of course, differences in immunogenicity could have a number of consequences on structure and function. So really, my premise here is that I'm going to take on the two major objections that I think Steve will raise, immunogenicity and then extrapolation across indications, which is a Canadian function that I'll uh, pay brief attention to. So the major issue is this one, immunogenicity, and I've made the case that the three-dimensional shape governs the issue, and we've come to recognize that it's clinically important and that it's impossible to predict in vitro. So all of these fancy characterization tests, they really can't predict it. And the human immune system has evolved over millions of years to do one thing very exquisitely well, and that's to recognize self and non-self. And it's hard to detect immunogenicity in vitro. There's lots of problems with assays. So here's the, question, the, the, the challenge that I think Steve is going to concentrate on. But not to put too fine a point on it, we've come to understand a lot of factors about immunogenicity, and we know that it is a problem and we have to respect it. And it's determined by product-related factors and a lot of clinical factors that we've heard about already today in this meeting regarding immunosuppression, uh, co-administration, the um, issues around root of administration, disease-specific factors and genetic factors. So there lies the problem, and we know that the clinical consequences uh, the biggest one being loss of efficacy is a challenge. And so you could set out the position that interchangeability is a direct threat for that problem, the development of adverse effects due to anti-drug antibodies, and therefore the ultimate stress test if you're trying to prove or trying to identify uh, a challenge with biosimilars would be to do multiple switches, which is really about changing with pharmacy uh, depending on what product is available. So that, that is the threat set out. Well, here's the issue, and this is uh, some chromatography which shows that there is heterogeneity in the innovator products. So as I mentioned before, these are not one identical molecular species. They themselves have a great deal of heterogeneity in the glycosylation pattern. 
And this can lead to the concept of drift, that depending on manufacturing processes over the years, that you can have variations in the uh, molecular species that constitute the various innovator molecules. Now, what the innovator companies will tell you is that, in fact, that's not a problem because we have quality control measures. And here we're seeing, actually, an examination of variability in glycosylation isotypes uh, within and being kept within certain ranges over time, and that's to reassure us. But remember that these molecular techniques in vitro cannot characterize the three-dimensional shape. There's no test that we can do to show the diversity um, and we, obviously there's going to be, within those ranges, there's going to be variations of species depending upon what uh, the cell lines are doing, and we know they're varying over time. So I would submit to you that the experiment, this experiment with regard to switching has already been done because as there's variation in the innovator products and we're exposed over time, then we probably have already stressed the system with regard to immunogenicity. And that may be the reason why we have, with monotherapy given continuously, about a 12% sensitization rate with our innovator pro pro products over time. So this may not be an issue at all because the experiment may be already been done. So the second issue is extrapolation. And this uh, was one of the reasons that Health Canada cited uh, to not extrapolate to, uh, with the biosimilar infliximab to IBD where they did allow extrapolation within the rheumatic diseases into psoriasis. And they come up with the idea that somehow that IBD was different with regard to antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity or ADCC. And when I look at the literature here, there's very little reason to support that. And in fact, when you look at ADCC, it's an important mechanism in vitro, but we really don't understand for any of the chronic immune diseases how important it is. Uh, in vivo in our patients. And we've already done an interesting experiment in this regard that probably disproves Health Canada's justification for extrapolation. And I draw your attention, which one doesn't look like the other ones? It's sertilizumab pegol. And from clinical trials, we know that sertilizumab pegol is, is effective. And I draw your attention to this experiment by Andrew Nesbitt, who actually looked at all of the molecules and actually demonstrated in this reverse signaling experiment that all of the molecules in, that we use that are effective in Crohn's disease therapy actually induce cytokine uh, expression, including uh, sertilizumab pegol, that downregulates pro inflammatory cytokines. In contrast, this drug, which in this study from Mayo Clinic was shown to be ineffective, did not do that. So, a drug without an FC receptor that can't mediate ADCC is effective in Crohn's disease and shows a consistent pattern with the IgG1 antibodies. So I don't really buy that story. So I'm going to conclude um, some facts. Biosimilars are here to stay. There's potential for large cost savings, and that has huge societal implications. Interchangeability and immunogenicity is the critical issue, and data regarding the immunogenicity of differences in carbohydrate residues are needed. So we need a proper switch study. I just throw out to you perhaps a provocative statement that this experiment has probably already been conducted. The Health Canada decision was not based on science, and you might draw some uh, conclusions of your own of why it was uh, made that way. And we think uh, in the future, I think you're all going to be using biosimilars within a very short period of time. Thank you.